And so I, uh, I said, no problem, I'll, I'll be there. And so I uh, hung up the phone, um, called my, my dad because I didn't know who else to call. And I was like, uh, I think I'm moving to Kansas City tomorrow. Hey everyone, welcome to the Founder Hour podcast. This is your co-host, Posh. Before we jump into episode 22 of our show, I want to quickly remind you all to subscribe and rate us on iTunes. It really means a lot to us. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Founder Hour. That's at The Founder Hour. And also make sure to subscribe to our newsletter and you can check that out on our website at www.thefounderhour.com. Now back to this episode. For episode 22 of the Founder Hour, Pat and I sat down with Jeff Morris Jr., who is the founder of Chapter One Ventures, an early stage seed fund investing in blockchain assets and mobile technology. When Jeff's not investing, he's the director of product and revenue at Tinder. In his role, he led the revenue team to the number one top grossing app, ranking in the app store and directs one of the top grossing products in mobile history. Tune in to hear Jeff's founder journey. Oh, and give him a quick follow on Twitter as well at JMJ. See you guys soon. Hey everyone, you're tuning in on the Founder Hour. We're your hosts, Pat and Posh, and we're here at Tinder HQ hanging out with Jeff Morris Jr. Uh, Jeff, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to have you at Tinder um, on this Warm Saturday afternoon. <laughs> I love it. Um, so the way we kind of like to kick things off is is really get a sense of your background. Um, yeah. So uh, I know you grew up in the Bay Area and then eventually moved down to L.A. for college. But tell us a little bit about your childhood. Yeah, sure. So I grew up um, five minutes from Stanford University in Menlo Park and um, was surrounded by tech growing up, but didn't really realize what was happening around me. Um, I knew a lot of my friends' parents worked in venture capital, and I knew... Um, you know, broadly what startups were, but, but it was, you know, I was, I was a kid, so it, it, I was just doing kid things. And, yeah. then, and then as I started to grow up and, and um, especially in high school, um, you know, I was in high school in 1999, which was when um, the dot-com crash happened. Mm-hmm. And I actually saw a lot of my friends, um, they, they left the, the, the neighborhood. Um, so they, their parents had come in and um, started companies. And then suddenly the, the crash happened and they were no longer uh, classmates mm-hmm. of mine. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was always around tech. Um, ended up actually coming to school at UCLA. Um, I also went to USC, so don't, don't uh, hate me for that. But, um, but I went to UCLA and, and studied English. Um, mm-hmm. Really didn't know what I was going to do with that. Um, I had a, a teacher in high school who um, took an interest in my writing, and it was like the first time that anyone took an interest in anything I was doing academically. Yeah. Um, and he inspired me to to pursue that. And um, at UCLA was kind of like, during that time, uh, entertainment was was still a dominant industry here. Obviously, that's, yep. that's changed a bit. Um, and so what would happen is if you were studying English at UCLA, um, a lot of production companies and agencies and, and studios would recruit us to, to read scripts for them. Mm. Um, so I would get paid to read scripts and give um, story notes on, on, on those scripts. I think they paid me like 50 or a hundred dollars a script. I forget what it was, but, um, but started to get really interested in storytelling. Um, entertainment was, was obviously a really cool thing to be a part of. Uh, and so I ended up going to USC film school directly after UCLA, Mm -hmm. um, to study producing. Um, so it was more of like a MBA for entertainment, um, graduated that program in 2000, nine, um, which is pretty much when the, the recession was happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so every single studio was, um, was cutting like half their workforce. And so we graduated from what we thought was the most competitive, uh, film program in, in the world, which it was by acceptance rate. Mm-hmm. And literally half my classmates and I were like, not, not able to get jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had no idea what I was going to do. I was also writing screenplays at the time. And, um, happened to get my first screenplay that I wrote option. It got me a manager and, and suddenly I was like um, writing screenplays because uh, it was really hard to get a job and I also really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Um, after after doing that for about a year, 
I realized that uh, there probably was a, a better way to make a living. Um, and, and I was also really starting to get more interested in, in, in tech. I had done tech inter internships in college um, while at UCLA. And um, Twitter was, was a big thing, obviously. At yeah. The, and I know you're, you're big on Twitter. I, 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 the, the reason I know about you is from Twitter because this is the first time we're meeting in person. But yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're an avid tweeter for sure. I am an avid <laughs> tweeter. Um, and one of, by, you know, one of the fav my favorite people on Twitter because I'm very into tech as well. So just kind of following what you're saying is, is you know, keep doing it. I awesome. It. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Um, so, so Twitter was like this equalizer for um, access to people and also um, just thoughts. And so I was starting to get um, more involved in the tech community on Twitter. And through that was starting to get um, more interest for, for kind of uh, full-time jobs in the industry. And mm -hmm. so um, I really quickly uh, packed up my bags, moved to San Francisco, um, was working uh, at a consulting firm for, for a brief period. And then um, decided to take the, the jump to actually join a company and actually got my first job on, on yeah. Twitter. So I want to definitely get into this this yeah. kind of part, um, but kind of going back to, to your, your childhood and, and growing up in, mm -hmm. in, in the Bay Area, and you said like most of the folks around you were in the tech community. Yeah. What, what did your parents do? So my parents, um, great question. So my dad is a commercial real estate um, developer, and he actually owns property on um, Sand Hill Road. So okay. nice. um, some of the venture capital firms that you've heard of are... are tenants of his mm. uh, but he nobody in my family did anything in tech um, you know it, it was kind of it wasn't a uh, unusual career choice because, yeah. because it was all around me but but it definitely wasn't something where I was walking into like a world full of connections um, yeah. and yeah definitely had to kind of pave my own way in the industry which which um, takes time so so Jeff you're in film school now at USC is that something you wanted to do where you wanted to produce films or produce TV shows? I mean, what was the trajectory uh, while you were in film school? Yeah, it was definitely to produce films. Um, my program had 25 people in it and 24 of us were going into film. Only one person was going into TV. Um, and I visited my film school two years ago and 24 out of 25 students are now going into television right. and only one person's going into film. So I guess... Uh, if we had seen the world that, that uh, is now entertainment, we probably would have all gone into television because, um, you know, Netflix, Amazon, yep. everyone's, everyone's producing Everything. original television content um, and not much film being produced. W were there any takeaways, you know, from film school that you, you know, use directly after or you still utilize today? Yeah, definitely. The... So one of the best things that, that I learned was um, like when you're selling a script or even visualizing um, a story that you might tell, thinking of the, the poster and how you're going to, to actually sell it. And so it's that combination of like the, what's like the big image like that will, will just get people's attention paired with what's the, um, what's the headline, what's the hook. Um, and so when I'm building products now, it's, I always have this this uh, kind of mindset, like what's what's the hook of the product, um, and kind of what's the image that's going to get people's attention. So, uh, kind of the the storytelling part of, of film school, um, you have to tell stories for any product you ever sell. Mm -hmm. um, even if you're not on the marketing team, if you're building products on the product side, like you're still going to to need to to tell stories. And I think that's the biggest thing that that I've learned is is how to tell a great story. Great. You mentioned just a bit ago that you got your first job on Twitter. Yeah. Tell us about that story. Yeah. So it was, um, I was living in, in the Mission District in San Francisco, um, and it was March 2011. And there was, um, I was working in a co-working space called Rocket Space, which um, I sat kind of a table like this next to Uber, who had 10 employees at the time. And so I was really obsessed with, um, I knew what they were doing was really interesting, and I, um, I, I thought the on-demand economy was, was just fascinating, especially paired with mobile. Um, there was something magical, and still is something magical about that space. And, and there was a company called Zarly, which was coming out, which was um, trying to be basically the Uber for everything. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you, you hear Uber for this and that, but not everything it, Uber for everything Uber. It was, it was, uh, from your phone, uh, <laughs> tell, tell us what you want. 
tell us what you're willing to pay wow. and we'll get it for you. Um, mm-hmm. And it could be anything. Um, the like the, the quick story that, that I remember is uh, I joined, so I joined the company um, from Twitter. I saw them tweet for, um, they're gonna hire a two month, it was a two month role um, mm-hmm. where you basically have to go improve yourself and, and with the potential of getting hired full time. And the job listing said, um, and I was, out, and they were also, they had pitched actually at Startup Week in LA. Mm. And Ashton Kutcher wrote a check for about a million dollars, um, or they were able to raise a million dollars in in a room just mm. at, at that pitch. Mm. Um, and I went to, to South by Southwest that year, and they were just, you know, every year at South by, there's like a couple um, really hot startups. Yeah. There was Foursquare in 2009, mm-hmm. I think it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were like the yeah. startup that year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, I'm, I'm going to get a job there. I'm going to figure it out. Um, and I saw that the tweet uh, applied, wrote a really, really um, kind of crafty cover letter um, where I basically took their model. So it's their model was, uh, what will you pay um, for for whatever you want? And I said, I basically told Zarly, I will pay you two months salary if you'll let me just... Uh, come and work in your office. Hmm. So I was willing to give up my salary. And so I kind of flipped their model um, and, and put that in my cover letter. Hmm. And they thought I was crazy. The The crazier part was the job listing said Seattle or Kansas City. So I had no idea where I was actually going to end up. And I was talking to the one of the co-founders and he said, I was like crossing my fingers that it would be Seattle because hmm. Seattle sounds pretty cool. Right. Yeah, West um, Coast, closer to home. Yeah. yeah everything, yeah. And so he said... Um, uh, this job is based in Kansas City. Great, yeah. <laughs> and so I, uh, I was like, okay, cool. Like two months, uh, like I can do that. And then I'm curious though, why why was that? Like why in Kansas City? Um, it was mostly the 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 CEO a guy named Bo Fishback huh. um, was based in Kansas City. Gotcha, gotcha. And so they um, they said basically on my first call, you uh, you seem great. Um, you can have the job if you come to Kansas City tomorrow. Because we we're moving fast right now, mm. and so I uh, I said no problem I'll I'll be there, and so I uh, hung up the phone, um, called my my dad because I didn't know who else to call, and I was like uh, I think I'm moving to Kansas City tomorrow, <laughs> and and I told him he, he he thought that was bizarre of course, and then I told him about what was what was happening, and he um, he said okay, and so I went online and started researching Kansas City, Kansas. Um, Thinking, I, I'd never been to Kansas City, yeah. and it turns out uh, I was going to Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. So I had the wrong state, even. Yeah. Uh, but I showed up there. I had, um, you know, one suitcase. I had no friends. I had no car. I had nowhere to stay. So I just got a hotel room. Um, ended up uh, splitting a room with one of my other coworkers, and then, um, you know, I was in Kansas City for the next. Eight months, and um, they and they didn't give you salary because you had given it up, or they ended up being like this uh, kid's crazy. We're gonna pay him. It was more they thought I was crazy, and uh, hey, we'll pay him some nominal amount yeah. uh, to see what he can actually do. Right. Um, but it was, you know, like when you're breaking into any industry, but especially tech, you need to just get your foot in the door, and once you're in, you're kind of you're kind of in. Like you work, mm-hmm. you work in tech once you once yeah. you get your first job in tech. So I was. Uh, so happy to be just like in the industry, um, and and the company ended up. Uh, it's still it's still alive. We ended up um, raising money from from Kleiner Perkins. I think um, we had raised like thirty million dollars within six months of being in existence. Wow. Um, and you know, eventually the the business model changed, like every company does. Mm. But but still still around. Um, didn't quite become the Uber for everything, but. Um, but a, a great yeah. um, experience that, that I'm really lucky I had. So what was your role uh, there? What were you learning? What were you doing day in and day out that led you to, you know, your next step? Yeah. So the role, um, super undefined. It was typical, like, Swiss Army knife, um, come in, uh, business development, marketing, operations. Yeah. Like, we just need help. And, and uh Gradually started to focus more on on kind of performance marketing, so paid marketing through Facebook, um, and with that became um, really kind of good at at optimizing um, sign up flows and, mm-hmm. and landing pages. 
And so that was product, um, even though I was on marketing, but I was, I was doing a lot of like growth marketing, um, mm-hmm. really, re- but really it was whatever, um, whatever needed to be done. Like the first day we went live, we had, I don't know how many requests it was, it was hundreds and hundreds all throughout the world. I remember, um, was it, sorry, was this on mobile only or was it a, like a web? Platform? It was mobile only at first. Then we did web, okay. but the, um, I think my best, my best, uh, like, request that I filled was, uh, we got a request from someone in Los Angeles asking, um, they said they needed a rabbi to be at their house tomorrow, um, which seemed like a bizarre request. And um, I was the only kid on the team from from California. So they said, Jeff, uh, you got to figure this out. And by the way, uh, the request came from Ashton Kutcher. Oh. And so I spent the next, uh, you know, two or three hours of my life, uh, calling up every Jewish friend I had in LA, um, <laughs> begging them to, to refer me a rabbi in, in Los Angeles. Um, it turned out one of my USC film school classmates, his wife was training to be a rabbi. Great. And so, uh, I don't know if she was fully credentialed, but she went to <laughs> his house the next day and yeah. she became Ashton Kutcher's rabbi for the day and taught his his kids, um, Hebrew for, for the afternoon. Um, wow. I feel like that was like Action Kutcher's way of testing yeah. the company and being like, okay, yeah. let, let's see what it's about and then maybe I'll invest. Yeah, every every, <laughs> every startup, you're, you'll are you see your investors test your product. Yeah. And in the background, you're like scrambling to make sure right. it's like the perfect experience. Yeah. And he um, was one of the investors, you said, right? He was one of the investors, yeah. So it was especially important to, to make sure that happened. But, um, you know, it was like, that was like my life for uh, three months. It's like, go here, go here, like mm. do this. Um, and really just being scrappy. And, um, you know, I didn't have uh, a girlfriend. I didn't have like anything in my life that uh, required me to, to, to do anything but work. Like yeah. I was I was working from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. I don't even know what hours every single night. Mm didn't work weekends like or I did work weekends I didn't have weekends yeah um and kind of just did what you needed to do that was I was living yeah. with my my coworkers. like that was my life uh, so um I mean Uber for everything that's yeah. I mean like was that the most bizarre thing you got or like was there something else that you're like whoa like I, I didn't even think that would even be a a request yeah. um I mean the bizarre one that we like we talked about a little bit was someone actually dropped their keys in the sewer and they requested someone to come help them get them out. And someone showed up with a fishing pole. And I don't know how they ended up getting the keys out of the sewer. Yeah. But they ended up getting the keys out of the sewer. Wow. And then you'd have, um, we did a ton of rides to the to the airport. We did mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of um, those requests. So we yeah. saw these like um, kind of micro uh, marketplaces happening. Yeah. And one of them was definitely transportation. And I remember the Lyft guys coming to our office um, and saying, hey, we're going to start an Uber competitor um, and they give us cupcakes and, and like uh, dessert uh, to, to try their product. But we were we were like sitting on top of all these trends that were happening and we didn't pick any single vertical. Yeah. Which, um, you know, like like lesson learned, um, uh, specializing in something and, and kind of like mastering one uh, customer experience is is definitely the the thing we should have done yeah um and we eventually kind of graduated the the initial thesis to becoming a, a home services marketplace so mm-hmm. um focused mostly on things like um handymen plumbers like really mm-hmm. uh not kind of like sexy um um but things that are still like very much needed every day yeah um and and probably and that wasn't as much needed in san francisco because uh, there aren't as many homeowners, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and so we ended up focusing, and still the company focuses more on like, um, you know, Charlotte, Nashville, like these like yeah. right. quote unquote like like second tier cities mm-hmm. with large amounts of home homeowners. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, like like uh, like se- taking a step back, we were so focused on building cool tech products for San Francisco yeah. that we kind of lost sight of the fact that that. The customers were probably in in other geographies, right? right. Um, so you're at Zarly for eight months, is that right? Is that you, was that was. Um, so I was actually there for, for over three years. Oh, okay. Um, so you're there for three years. Yeah, I was. I was like doing everything. Or at some point, you said you started focusing more on growth. I've started focusing more on growth. So by the time I left, I was um, kind of running the growth marketing team. Um, 
which went through many different uh, mm-hmm. kind of like uh, focuses and, and strategies. But but yeah, it was mostly um, just growth marketing. Mm-hmm. So um, what did you do after you left? So I left and I really, um, so I left actually to start a company, um, <laughs> which, which didn't quite... Um, get off the ground as we want to. So it was, it was, I was still obsessed with, with on-demand products. Um, and also was, um, kind of had identified that going to the gas station isn't, isn't a very fun thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, with, um, it's that feeling you get when you're (laughs) sitting in your car and you just, you're on E and you have to go be somewhere in like five minutes. Exactly. Um, and I, there was a venture capitalist, um, at Charles River Ventures who really loved this idea. And so we were, I was working with him and another venture capitalist to, um, to test the idea. And so we, for about six months, I was, I was, um, really like deeply immersed in this, in this world that is, is how, um, how gas gets from, from wherever it comes from to your car, Mm. um, and was, was doing deliveries in, in Menlo Park. I didn't Mm -hmm. do that many, um, had a tank on the back of my jeep wrangler and was delivering gas um to to friends and family we, again we didn't do very many because it was uh definitely not legal and and definitely yeah. um <laughs> not fun work uh you know most people want their gas early in the morning or late at night so um yeah i was doing that and i was also um building a lot of products so um i, I built three products that were number one on product hunt within two months um and that was when Product Hunt was kind of like first coming out and was really, really kind of, and still is, but, but it, was, it was a really kind of hot. Yeah. yeah. These were your own products or these were products um, like freelance for other? They were my own products because okay. I was, I was um, learning web development at the time yeah. um, and also just, I was just in that, that kind of like mindset where I'm going to test like 20 different ideas and see in the easiest Which one way works, possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there were... There were things that 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 went really well that I thought could potentially be full time companies. Um, the after doing the, kind of the product hunt thing, um, I started to get a lot of job offers and product um, people were reaching out, mm. and so I, I I just started doing freelance consulting. Um, worked with a bunch of really cool companies, and and kind of got distracted from my own companies because I was like um, becoming more known in the product community, um, especially on places like Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, and then sometime in 2015, I I ended up, um, joining, joining Tinder. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff, you mentioned that whole gas thing. I I know recently I'd seen a company that's doing that where, well, I think they literally have like trucks where they deliver gas and I think they raise a good amount of venture capital uh, money as well. I can't remember the name of the company. Um, there's one that's based in LA actually called Purple. Um, there's one called Yoshi. There's like there's a few. There's yeah, so yeah, many yeah, of them yeah. now. Um, it's like gas on demand. Yeah. God, gas on demand. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Um, you know, like one thing I also thought about a lot. I met with um, there was a guy at Greylock who was an EIR, and he actually got really deep on this idea too. And he told me something that that really stuck with me. He's like, you know, I I thought a lot about doing this idea, but I picture myself <laughs> like best case scenario, this goes really well, and I picture what my life would be like. And he's like, I would be hanging out at oil industry conventions and like um that's just not like like where I want to be yeah. like and so I, then I started to think I was like picturing myself like like doing the same thing in and Texas like, hanging out with cowboys and <laughs> yeah and like um uh, not that there's anything yeah, yeah, wrong yeah. with with that yeah. but like like you just know not what you envisioned your life to be no and, and you have a choice like when you start a company or join a company like who do you want your peers to be and what problems you want to solve and what do you want to dedicate your your life to right and you have to feel inspired by your environment right totally yeah to be able to do great work yeah and i've never some there's some founders who can who can dedicate their lives to an idea because it's a great business opportunity and there's no like emotions there um which is fine they're great operators and they can run hopefully profitable companies but for me personally it's it has to be emotional there Mm -hmm. has to be um a lot, something personal about the, the problem you're trying to solve and, and you have to be proud to be doing that every single day. Um, there's way too many cool companies in the world. There's too many things to, to build and solve yeah. that um, if you're not 
if you're not emotionally inspired, like uh, you should be doing something else. So, so you said you joined uh, Tinder. Why did you join Tinder? Where was Tinder at that point at the stage of the company? Um, yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, Tinder was, in terms of just size, it was it was sixty people, uh, much smaller office than this this office. Uh, it was basically two floors um, down the road, but but it was a very small team. Um, the product team was was just a couple people, um, not a ton of to kind of like infrastructure or um, or kind of like processes, but the the company was doing amazing. Um, it was 2015. Tinder was launched in yeah. 2012, and it was already a global brand, just not a big company yet. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason why I loved Tinder, quite frankly, is is I online did it for a couple of years and and had some life changing experiences, met um, amazing people, and and just thought the the challenge of of bringing two strangers together and and building trust and creating um, amazing relationships um, was just a really cool challenge to solve. Yeah. Uh, just to play devil's advocate there, because I mean, like I know my parents' generation, I mean, they find that weird. They yeah. find, you know, they even find things like Uber weird, like where you're sitting in somebody else's car for Airbnb, you know, sleeping in someone else's home. How, how is it like, or how was it like dealing with that challenge of really kind of overcoming that frame of mind or really kind of eradicating that notion that, Sure, you know, it, it's only weird because it hasn't really happened before, but we're trying to tackle ways to kind of get rid of that, you know, state of mind that you have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, like you said, a lot of it's generational. Yeah. Um, the, you know, my generation and, and younger generations are really used to, to living their lives online and having a lot of their relationships begin online um, for many different reasons. Um, the... The industry as a whole, online dating, has been around for 25, 30 yeah, years. Yeah, with eHarmony um, Match and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah and I've actually done um, studies and, and online dating as people used to take out newspaper ads in really uh, the 1800s to, to advertise themselves. For themselves. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so so the, the kind of... <laughs> eligible bachelor. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, but but the, like the, the, the trust um, challenges will always exist for any kind of online to offline product. The truth is when you meet someone out in, in public that you've never met, um, who you don't have a warm introduction um, to, there's actually a lot more unknowns. Yeah. Um, we're, we're showing you um, where this person went to school, where they work. Um, you, can, you can see Instagram photos. You can have a conversation. There's a lot more... Um, kind of diligence you can do on that person before you actually meet. Um, so in 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 that um, sense, it's actually a much better, more efficient way to meet people. Yeah. Um, and that's that's always been kind of I think why people like online dating. Going out um, is kind of it's kind of a, a I don't want to say a scary uh, thing because going out's fun, but but there's just a lot more unknowns when you go mm-hmm. out. Um, and this is an easier way to, to meet people. Yeah. So since the time you've joined, obviously Tinder's grown exponentially, uh, you know, and you've been behind a lot of the, you know, product initiatives like Tinder Gold and, and, and such. Um, what would you say has been like the biggest challenge this far for you? Yeah, I think um, I think the biggest challenges for me have, have just been around um, picking the right products. Like the the amount of ideas um, that exists at a company like Tinder, are, it's it's like infinite because there's yeah. so many directions and there's so many things you can do at any given time. So it's always just you're bringing of, people together. At the end of the day, it's like you, there's so much that could be. There's done. so much like yeah. like do you focus on um, kind of the post match experience? Like what happens when you match and how do you um, how do you make that more convenient? Or do you do you focus on pre match like? There's so many uh, places to, to focus. So for me, it's just been about picking the right products. Um, luckily, I have uh, a great team who helps do that. And we, we've, on the revenue team, which is the team I, I work on, um, we've, we, we've done an amazing job of picking the right products, um, have been really kind of fortunate with, with that part of, of the business. Uh, 
how do you, you know, as, as somebody who's managing a team and, you know, there are a lot of unknowns even in, within the, you know, within this product, you know, what is your, how do you, how do you manage the team? How do you kind of set the vision and how do you work with them? Yeah. To, to execute, you know, your goals. Yeah, I think, um, I think the, the, the biggest thing that I've learned is, is, um, you need to, to include everybody um, in the process at the right time. So especially working with engineers, um, really making sure that, that uh, they're your partners on, on the products um, and not so much like you're, you're coming in a room and saying, uh, this is what we're going to build. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's about kind of um, taking inputs from every uh, part of the office. Um, it could be engineering, it could be marketing, it could be legal, it could be finance, um, there's so many and then, and then it's trying to, to uh, distill those inputs and, yeah. and create the, the best possible product. Um, and then it's, it's really about like just putting yourself in, in the customer's mindset. You're not building the products for mm-hmm. um, yourself most of the time. So it's, it's always coming back to the customer. Like, what does the customer want? Um, is this valuable? Um, will they have fun with the product? Like there's, there's, it's, always, it's always about... Uh, you know the value proposition, figuring out what that is for every every product. How do you guys do that? Do you do you? How do you gain feedback from your users? Yeah, um, it's a lot of it's uh, like like the feedback can be quantitative. It's staring you in the face because you're looking at dashboards every day, right. and there's some um, glaring opportunity that that you just need to build. Mm-hmm. Or it could be more qualitative, like um, you know, like like doing real customer interviews or. Um, even like Tinder is a product where if you go uh, outside and tell people whether you're at a restaurant or a coffee shop you or you know you're at, at dinner with your fiance and her single friends like you get a ton of feedback on the product yeah. mm-hmm. and so um, you know if you're working at like a smaller SaaS company or a smaller startup um, you probably won't have that amount of yeah. uh, kind of like like uh, Feedback that that uh, you get here. Um, mm-hmm. So, product the concept of product management always fascinates me because it's so many, so you know, so many, you know, different things coming together. Like there's a creative aspect, and then there's like you know the, the analytical aspect, and looking at numbers and making sure that you can sustain it, like through revenue, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, where do you get your passion for creating products? Like thinking back, you know, throughout your life, like was there anything that maybe like you were just super into that? this kind of stems from yeah i think um i think it really goes back for me to the the storytelling days the Mm -hmm. um ucla reading stories um i was always amazed when i was working on on um film film products or um or actually my own screenplays that you can create things just with kind of a a pen and a piece of paper like you can you can create um, real tangible things that impact the world, um, just just sitting in a room, and that was like the 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 kind of like, um, and of course like like I, I had that brief stint at at the consulting firm, yeah. and I was like, I don't want to be telling other companies uh, what their problems are. Like I want to be the one like solving the problems, mm-hmm. um, and and so, it, you know, and then just being being around entrepreneurs, like if you. If you get in this world, um, you kind of never want to leave. Like, uh, you know, a lot of my friends were entrepreneurs, and they left, and they became full-time investors or whatever. Like, this is way too much fun to to do anything else. Um, at least right now, like, like I still have the passion and energy to do this every day, and um, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yeah, kind of on that on that note. Um, I know you've had you know your own company before, uh, or, you know briefly. Yeah. Uh, do you see yourself? I know we'll talk about chapter one, but, yeah, sure. um, but you know, uh, aside from investing, do you see yourself like ever getting into starting your own company, like in the product service space? Um, I do. I think the the biggest thing is um, finding a problem that you actually want to spend like seven to ten years of your life doing, um, maybe more, uh, and. Seven to ten years of your life within five years of real real life. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I haven't like there. There's been ideas that that I've um, thought would be really interesting to solve, but I haven't, or at least at this very moment, there's not one thing that I really want to mm-hmm. pursue. Mm. Um, but I would love to start a company one day. Um, the the idea of starting a company is um, really appealing to me. So I think 
that will happen at some point. I'm just, um, I think I think we're always, all of us are searching for, for the next idea. Right. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, without, I guess, giving away too much, what are some of the problems that you personally, you know, see can be solved, whether you solve them yourself or whether they're the problems of the future? What, what are some things that, you know, people should look out for in the next five to 10 years? Yeah. Um, you know, I think you, there's, there's a couple things. Like one way to, to discover problems is to look at kind of emerging platforms and mm-hmm. what they're doing to solve things. Um, I, I'm sure many people um, feel the same way right now. I think mm-hmm. uh, blockchain technology is by far the coolest thing happening in tech right now. And the problems that that can solve are kind of infinite. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm definitely thinking and, and also investing a lot in in the blockchain space. Um, and then other products, I still think I still think there's a lot of things that haven't been solved uh, on mobile yet. And if you look at at um, consumer usage, like we are all so addicted to our phones, mm-hmm. and that's not changing anytime soon. Mm. Um, there's this narrative in in um, venture capital that that mobile is kind of like everything's been created already. Um, I just don't see that to be true. Mm. So I think um, I think I think I'm going to focus on digital products. Um, Subscriptions. I'm really. I love the um, recurring relationship with customers. I think that's yeah. It's, it's exactly one of the notes that we had down was like that. You love subscription products. I love it. We, yeah. we love subscription products. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, we do too. Uh, what I'm wearing right now, five four, is, it is. D, it's D's subscription product. Yeah, um, I love five yeah. four. I love D. So I mean, so why do you love it? I guess, or what, what, why do you think that it's something that will continue to be appealing to you know customers? Yeah. I, lo- I love it for a lot of reasons. One, um, I love that you can build a long-term relationship with the customer. And I love the fact that um, if, you're, if you don't keep innovating and building products that, that they love, they're, they're, they, they'll leave. Yeah. Um, and so it's the, the incentives on both sides are... They always keep you accountable. They keep you accountable and it's perfectly aligned. And if you look at um, the narrative in tech right now, the ad model is something that um, is really in a dangerous mm-hmm. position right now. Yeah. Um, the amount of data that, and you've seen like the past week, all the Facebook mm-hmm, data mm-hmm. issues, consumers um, are starting to to rebel against um, everything that's happening online. The and, and the, the idea that if you pay a subscription, you can avoid mm-hmm. that part of the world and just focus on the the value with your customer and, and both sides. I think is is that's the most I think pure relationship with a customer you could possibly have, um, and then of course the the business model is great. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, having predictable revenue, having um, LTVs that you can calculate really really easily over time. Um, I just think I think that's the coolest thing ever. Um, I also love digital products um, for subscriptions because you create something once and it kind of lives forever. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the some of the subscription models I've seen are, are operationally really challenging, yeah. Um, and the margins aren't aren't always that great, especially um, when you go into like the B two C space as opposed to B two B because it's like you know individuals trying to carve out income to spend every single month on something. Exactly. Or year. Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, so I'm not as interested in like subscription boxes as much as as like what are really cool new um, models. One of the companies that's based in LA. Uh, that I really love right now is Headspace. Um, it's digital content. They own all the margins. Um, they have a recording studio in the office. They're not doing payouts to artists, mm-hmm. and um, they're helping people live live healthier lives. Um, so it's kind of like every single checkbox, mm-hmm. um, you know, TBD on how defensible that business is, but but um, but it's a really cool cool model. And and so yeah, I'm I'm trying to think. Always about about different um, kind of digital subscription plays. Let's talk about chapter one. Um, yeah. This is a, a venture firm essentially that you launched recently. Tell us yeah. tell us more about the thinking behind launching that and and how it's been so far. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I was I started investing in two thousand twelve um, mostly through I was meeting a lot of people in the industry. Um, my first investment was I was doing diligence on a, a SaaS vendor. Who were pitching me for uh, an integration at, at Zarly, actually, and it was like six Stanford PhDs, and they were um, 
Yeah. Whatever you're building, here's the money, just build it. <laughs> I, was, I was basically like, uh, by the way, are you guys raising money? And he's like, yeah, we actually are. Um, and I, I wrote a, you know, a, small, a smaller check, um, but I got on my first cap table. And it's um, when you invest in one company, it's, it becomes kind of addicting. Like yeah. you want uh, to invest in more. And also just from a kind of a portfolio point of view, it's actually smarter to invest in, in many companies. Diversify. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I've invested in about 30 companies, um, a little over that. And, and the, um, I think maybe a year and a half, two years ago, um, started to, to see that, that people were becoming more interested in, in my investments. And so I started a SPV on AngelList, um, have at this point over 300 investors who are investing, um, in my deals. Mm-hmm. They're, Private deals that they um, see, it's 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 with an angel list there. But but the the idea is, um, I was starting to take investing a lot more seriously and, and spending more time on it. And I wanted to create a brand and really create um, kind of formalize what I was doing and create a company. Um, and so you know, create an LLC and yeah. next thing you know, you're you're uh, you're starting a company and, and right. it's it's gone a really really well. We've done um, twelve investments in the past year um and the name is chapter one so um does that mean that you're going to stay early stage forever or do you see that i mean are you like interested chapter in two chapter, <laughs> chapter two yeah yeah, yeah. Um, dba not yeah. chapter 11 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no. no chapter 11 no chapter 13 we'll skip those chapters none of those chapters yeah it's like they skip what, what is it they skip the 13th floor the 13th floor. yeah just, just skip that shit yeah um you know I, th- I think uh early stage is where i probably will add the most value and um, personally, it's the most exciting to me. Mm-hmm. That said, um, you know, I did, I invested in Lyft uh, last, towards the end of last year, and that was definitely later stage. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, I think I will focus mostly on early stage, but um, chapter one was, was kind of just a tribute to like the storytelling part of, of this world that I love. Yeah. Um, and also, um, you know, more focusing towards, towards those earlier stage deals. So Jeff, you mentioned that you work with, uh, 300 or so investors. So how does that work? You, do you find the, like, do you send them these companies that they could potentially invest in and then they back it with capital? Or is it more of a collaborative effort of, hey, you know, I saw this company, you know, let's we should do our due diligence. You know, each of us puts an X amount in. What does that process look like? Yeah, sure. So the, um, so I'll, I'll go um, talk to hundreds of companies, um, I don't know how many I've talked to, but it's been a lot. Mm-hmm. And and I'll find um, startups that I believe in and, and want to invest in personally. So I'll, I I personally invest some portion of it, and then I offer the deal to to my group, and everyone opts in on a deal by deal basis. So they're not um, tied to any deal that they don't right. want to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the um, the founders that I work with love it because um, most of the people in my investment group are. Um, Pretty high-level technology executives at Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter, like ev- yeah. every company pretty much at this point has um, some executive in my in my group, um, and they get access to these really smart people. And also, they don't have to. Whereas, as an angel can write um, some check size, that's a typical angel check. We can do much larger deals, so we can rather than going to like a coffee shop and pitching mm-hmm. twenty angels, they can get. Um, you know, a 300k check through basically a, a diligence process of, of convincing me that it's worth um, kind of bringing to my investment group. Mm-hmm. That's great. So, ha- um, is it just you kind of like facilitating everything, or do you have like partners uh, in the group? Right now, it's just um, it's just myself uh, full time, and the I do a lot of deals with different people, mm-hmm. but. Um, but yeah, it's, it's myself kind of running the, the day-to-day. Full-time, part-time, because you're also working at <laughs> Yeah. Day, so so how, do you, how do you manage that time in between? Um, so I mostly, so basically I do a call every day on the, on the drive to work, um, which is, that's when LA traffic actually works in your favor. Yeah. Um, so I can talk, I do at least five calls every week in the morning on the way to work, and then um, nights and weekends, um, I pretty much work every day at this point, yeah. uh, for better or worse. So thank you to to my friends and family who support that because they don't see me very often. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, it's it's um, it is. It's it's a full time job, but it's uh, it's full time knowing that that Tinder is my number one priority and and um, where my yeah. 
where my time should be spent um, mm-hmm. definitely during the week. And so, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's, it's mostly just like waking up an hour earlier. Um, yeah. And to talk about that, actually, yeah. I know you, you mean, you know, the amount of time that you work, you also make time to wake up and do yoga and uh, tell, <laughs> tell us about oh that. Tell us about like your, you know, your life outside of work. If you know, whatever 20 yeah. minutes it is. Yeah. So I wrote an article, maybe which you probably read because you just referenced it. Um, when I joined Tinder, it was it was my morning routine dot com, mm-hmm. and I got so much shit from all my coworkers uh, because <laughs> so, they didn't know about this part of my life, and it was like, and Jeff, maybe they Jeff, didn't want to know. Yeah, yeah Jeff, 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 you do yoga to two chains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so the the truth is like my routine changes probably every four or five months. Like. Like any, like most humans, like uh, everything I do is is done in like uh, phases. But but I do work. I work out um, most days before work. Uh, wake up at at about six o'clock. Work out. Um, you know, and and doing my calls at eight a.m. So I'm kind of starting my my work day at eight a.m. But um, but yeah, and then outside of work, I mean, it's a lot of um, typical LA things like. There's no shortage of things to do here, but yeah. um, I just got engaged, so I'm planning that's a wedding right now. That's uh, a that's a full time yeah. job too. <laughs> yeah, you don't know how hard it is to pick pick a wedding band. I have like my parents want me to hire like some like Motown type of band, and we yeah. want to hire like the cool DJ. It's that it's that you know pulling from both sides <laughs> of like what the parents want, but then also like what you want you and just like what, do your, both. Yeah, you just what your do friends both. might want. Oh yeah. yeah, the the easiest thing to do would just be to have two weddings, but right. Um, or, yeah. or, or, or you want the Motown band? Great. Would you like to gift it to us? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's fantastic. Exactly. Fantastic. That would be a, that's probably a yeah. good solution. I'll propose yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, they, if you want it, I mean, I'm more than happy to have it as long as you pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that, yeah. So where do you see, you know, I know you talked about, you know, wanting to eventually start a company and, you know, chapter one is obviously ramping up. Where do you see your, you know, your career in the next, you know, five years, uh, you know, would you still be at Tinder? Would you, you know, continue doing Chapter One, start your own company, all of those things, you know, or do you just not even plan that? You just kind of take it day by day. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's it's really important to to kind of plan your career as much as you can. Um, the truth is, it's really really hard to plan right. your career, and so the more you, I find the people who like uh, put their five year goals on a piece of paper, um, while it's smart, like it's it's a little bit um, and it's a good act exercise to, to plan, uh, it never kind of works out how you yeah. think it's going to work out. Yeah. And so um, to be really candid, like I, I love working at Tinder. Um, this is amazing. And, and I have like no plans of doing anything else in, in the near term. Um, the like I, I do know I want to in my career continue to work on product teams like this is so much fun. Um, I'm having Literally, like I think I'm having like like the best time of my life right now, um, and and so I. Like I said, like the thought of, of doing anything else just seems seems sad to me. Like I, like this is what I want to do, so right. I'm gonna keep doing this. Right, and I just I just love that because and we talk about it all the time. It's like it's very tough to pursue your passion and then also at the same time find a way to monetize and make money on the passion. But it just seems like you were able to find what you were passionate about early on. It was not anything that you were really like exposed to either, you know, growing up. And you just kind of ended up doing it and got into space and you're continuing to grow in that space. So what would be your tip to those to that, you know, have these passions, whether it's in the tech industry or whether they want to be a musician or whether they want to, whatever they want to do, you know, what can they do to help accelerate, you know, pursuing that passion and, you know, turning it into a career? Yeah. I think um, like you, you touch on a really interesting thing, which is uh, your passions aren't always aligned with um, how you can actually make money. Right. Like, um, and that's a really hard thing for people to realize. Mm-hmm. Um, if there is a way to like, like, you, like take your passion and think of, of some customers or some cohort of people who would pay for it and you can possibly create a, a business out of it. The truth is though, like, uh, our our world is is evolving where like people have multiple careers at once. Yeah. Um, you know, like my um, my fiance is an artist, 
but she has um, a full time job in e commerce. You know, she paints at night. But mm, mm. Um, how many? I mean, we see this in LA all the time. How many musicians are also yeah working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I work at a restaurant, but I'm also an Instagram influencer. Yeah, yeah. and so um, <laughs> that's not to be discouraging. But no, if yeah. you have a passion. Um, you should do that, but you also need to... You need to live. You need to live. Yeah. And so figure out um, how to create more time in your life to do both and, and perhaps your passion um, becomes something that actually be, can be a profession. Yeah. Um, don't give up on your passion, but have a realistic point of view on, on how you're going to you know, build a career. Um, it was really hard for me, actually, uh, when I was screenwriting... I had to leave, like, I, I, I was like, this is not how I'm going to make money and be, uh, you know, this is not the best way to live my life. Yeah. But I loved it. Um, so I left, and now I write about technology, and I build products, and I, mm-hmm. I get that creative outlet. But it's not, it wasn't where I initially thought it was going, right. going to come from. Um, so be flexible in, in also your pursuit of your passions. One thing I actually forgot to mention, is it, is it true that you're also getting your MBA right now? That's true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just trying to picture yeah. your day, and it's like, I don't even know how you do it. But, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I had, um, I mean, two nights ago, I was at UCLA till 11 o'clock at night. So, yeah. Um, yeah. but uh, so I do on the weekends, um, I'm mostly at UCLA um, doing that. Um, why is that? Why, why, why did you pursue your MBA? Yeah, I think um, a lot of things. One, I was starting to do, obviously, a lot more investing and um, didn't have kind of a formal uh, finance background. Mm. And, you know, as you're starting to, to do um, possibly raise a bigger fund one day, like, like really want to make sure I have the, the foundational kind of like, um, you know, basic knowledge to, to, the to make sure the know-how to do that. Yeah. Also, um, I've always really wanted to kind of like, I've loved, I love, I um, love, being in a classroom, like, uh, have always, always loved that part of, part of life and, and kind of the, um, knowing, admitting that you still have things to learn. So, but be, but getting an MBA and working in tech isn't cool. Like, that's why I probably didn't mention this in, in this interview. Um, <laughs> I have to bring it up. Sorry. I, no, 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 no. I, I'm, <laughs> well, I think it's I'm interesting it, because yeah. a lot of people, you know, there's this notion that entrepreneurs are, you know, hate school and they're, they're not good, you know, uh, students and they, they break the rules and all these things. But yeah. at the same time, like, you know, you exemplify kind of the both sides of it where it's like you're you're eager to learn. You like being in the classroom, but also uh, you're not afraid to take risks and, and all that. So, yeah, that um, that narrative, actually, I got in a, a Twitter um debate last weekend uh, with the venture capitalist who um, was really critical of, of Harvard. Uh, something happened at, at the Harvard MBA program in him. Um, and he, like the narrative was, this is why I tell entrepreneurs to never get an MBA. Um, and I think like those prescriptive, like anything in life that's prescriptive for everybody is normally not true because mm-hmm. everybody is their own person and everyone has their own. There's no one size fits all. Journey, yeah. yeah. Um, so for me, you know, I, I, I think getting an MBA is great. Great. I think, I think, um, taking finance classes, taking accounting, Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are things that you can help you in any, any part of your life. For sure. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's why I'm doing it. There's no, you know, I'll admit like when I'm driving home from class at 11 o'clock on a Thursday night, I'm like, why, why am I doing this? Um, but, but, you know, I, I do believe that, some something from it will will help me in life right. um and so that's kind of where i'm at the one final question i have is i know we mentioned it a little bit that you know and we love your tweets we see on twitter yeah how do you find the time or how do you find the inspiration to tweet what you are tweeting and kind of share you know your thoughts with you know and you have a pretty big audience on twitter um you know how, how do you how do you even manage that all that stuff yeah um i mean luckily most of my st- my things that i tweet are like really on the go um, like I'm at the gym and like something uh, just pops in your mind. And like, yeah, it's it's really um, and I'm just I'm just like taking the things I see every day and trying to um, make them high level enough so they're they're approachable for a larger audience. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really just about like like looking at what's happening in your life at that moment and realizing 
whatever's happening, even though it might not seem interesting to you, is probably interesting to, to other people. For sure. Um, people love hearing about the process um, of anything. Mm. And so I'm just trying to share little tidbits of my life that are the process of building products at Tinder, which mm-hmm. um, is always kind of a fun, uh, adventurous thing. And so people people love hearing it. Um, but the the honest truth is, like, I, I just see things and I don't... Um, I have filters because everyone has filters, but... But I, I try and be as honest and transparent right. about what I'm seeing around me, and people people respond to that. Mm-hmm. Well, Jeff, it's been a great conversation with you. Thanks so much for your time Thank and you so know, learning about uh, your your journey. And we're excited to see, you know, how you continuously evolve. You know, whether it's at Tinder or Chapter One or beyond. Um, so yeah, thanks again for the time. Thank you for coming. Yeah, this you. was this yeah. was a lot of fun, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.